Hello, everybody. Hope you all are doing well. I'm Alan Lilienthal, and welcome to Port of Entry Live. Today, we're lifting the curtain on our production process by inviting you folks to join us as we interview director, animator, and artist Jorge R. Gutierrez for a future episode we're going to do on the podcast. Jorge, for those of you who don't know him, is an impressive human, one of the most and one of my favorite border artists working today. Um, he's the director of the Book of Life movie. He and his wife, Sandra Ikea, are the creators of the hit Nickelodeon show El Tigre, The Adventures of Manny Rivera. And he's got a lot of new exciting projects coming out with Netflix very soon. So before we get going, a little housekeeping first. Uh, if you have any questions or comments during the interview, go ahead and type them into the YouTube comments. And my producer, Kinsey Moreland, will send them to me at the end and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Also, after the interview, we'll follow up with an email that will include links to, to all of Jorge's work and anything we mentioned, shows and projects that come up during the talk. All righty then, let's begin this interview. Jorge Gutierrez, welcome to Port of Entry Live. Thank you for doing this with us. Alan, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I got to tell you, my wife is a huge fan of, of the podcast, out of you. Uh, and wow. She would murder me if I don't tell you her last name is Ekiwa. Uh, Ekiwa. Ekiwa. Pretend it's Japanese. Uh, yeah. It's Ekiwa, you, and you told me that. And I, yeah, I yeah. apologize, Sandra. I think, you know. Uh, no, 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 no. Thank you. Thank you. You said good though. It's one of those things that people people like let it slide, but but it means so much when someone pronounces your name correctly. Oh, and by the way, it's Ekiwa. a spell. <laughs> so. hey. Well, it's a good thing we're talking about talking about Japanese things, anime, animation. That's why we're here today. Um, before we kind of trace your origin story mm -hmm. back to the border, I want to just talk a little bit about what you're currently working on and your big project, which I'm very excited about. Uh, it's called Maya and the Three, and it's coming out with this recent deal you just inked with Netflix, which is also super exciting. That's congratulations. Um, but Maya and the Three which is an animated series about a Mesoamerican warrior princess. Um, you've, you've described it as a Mexican Lord of the Rings, which I'm sure a lot of people are going to really love. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how this came about and the quick summary of the, this epic quest you're taking this princess on? Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm originally from Mexico City, and I moved to Tijuana when I was a little kid. And one of the things that happens to, to, I think, to a lot of Mexicans is that the further you get away from the center, the more you romanticize it. Mm. Um, seeing a lot of the imagery of, uh, you know, the, the, like the handsome Aztec man holding the beautiful lady uh, with, with the popo, uh, you know, volcano behind them. All those images that I saw in cobijas and in the side <laughs> vans and, you know, and tattoos and everywhere. I've always kept going like, wow, the women are, are, are just the object of desire and they're the, the prize or the, they're, they're never the warrior. Why are the warrior women? Where are, where, you know, where, where, if this, a lot of this stuff is mythology, uh, what, why are there no more women? And so I looked into a lot of the, the, the myths and, you know, especially the Aztec warrior is such a huge part of, of Mexico. It's in the money, it's in the soccer teams, it's everywhere. So I said, I think, I think we should we should hack mythology, hmm. and uh, and I'm going to create this warrior princess, and it's going to be a metaphor for today, and it's going to be a metaphor for the history of of, uh, of 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 the women of Mexico who don't get credit for being warriors. Uh, hmm. you know, just being married to a Mexican man, you're already a warrior. You already <laughs> already deserve a medal. Uh, so all the all the women in my life, my my grandma, my mom, my wife, my sister. I mean, the, the lives they've lived, these are warrior women. So I wanted to honor them with the show. Oh, that's beautiful, man. Um, yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's incredible because like we were talking about a little bit before, uh, storytelling is so much more than entertainment. You know, I think if we want a lot of these societal issues to, to shift to a more harmonious place, the storytellers have a huge responsibility. The stories we tell, you know, really kind of shape, shape our future. So... I'm super stoked to see that. Uh, I hear it's going to have a, a soundtrack that includes a lot of metal music. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, so wow. Is uh, Gustavo Santolaya. 
and he's working with uh, another composer named Tim Davies from Australia. And, you know, Gustavo Santalaya was, was very much a part of the 90s sort of rock and Espanol era of music that I, I was in high school when all those things happened. I, I joke with them that I lost my virginity to his soundtrack. Uh, he <laughs> When I, when I would tell him that, he, he, he would like just shake his head. Uh, but all that influence, Caifanes, Malita Vecindad, you know, Café Tacuba, obviously. Uh, and so there's metal, because to me, you know, there's a lot of metal bands, and especially in South America, that were huge. So all that made it into the show, and all those ideas that culture is fluid and culture evolves. Mm. And to a kid today, the music from the 90s is ancient. So that's ancient music now. So that, that was a big part of that. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, in a, in a lot of your work, I can see this, but it sounds like in my end of three, there's going to be a lot of kind of mishmash of Mexican, American pop culture, indigenous folklore, all kind of meshed into this story. Yeah, I mean, that that was another big thing that I, you know, in Book of Life, some people were a little shocked to see our main character sing a Radiohead song in the middle of a bullfight in 1910 Mexico. And I said, if I, if I used an authentic song of that time, no one would know it. But by taking things that I lived through and remixing them and re basically appropriating the soul of what those uh, songs meant into the context of the movie, then you, you, you get to introduce into a whole new generation and you get to introduce the, the, the duality of, of honestly the border, right? Because mm. I heard Creep sang by mariachis and I said, look how great that song is that it, that it, you know, it, it went somewhere else. And I remember at the time, I didn't know any better. So I put it in the script and Guillermo del Toro, who, who's the producer, said, you're, you're not going to get the song. Uh, they denied the song to, you know, Alfonso Cuaron. They denied me the song. There's no way in hell you're going to get the song. So I, I wrote I wrote the band and we sent them a video of the moment in the movie and I explained how that song was basically my my war cry as a teenager when I didn't think I belonged and how much it meant to me and how as a kid in Tijuana, that was literally my, my little flag that I raised. And, and Tom York said, yeah, you can use it based on the on Wow. So I am eternally thankful to Radiohead. And after that, every band we asked who was on the fence about letting us use their songs, uh, we would say, oh, so, so you think you're better than Radiohead? Is that what you <laughs> Tom York said yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, it seems like just having grown up at the border and crossing the border, I'm sure on the way to school and on and all that, it seems like a lot of that, the bright and wild, colorful visuals that you see at the border are very influential in your work. And I know in this book of yours that I have right here, Border Bang, which this light is not letting me show, but anyways, um, you shout out the border and like all the border vendors who we've spent a lot of time talking to and their creativity and entrepreneurial spirit, how, how they're like, they seize on pop culture and taking and the zeitgeist, you know, and any characters, movie stars, rock stars, and kind of make make them their own and are able to make a living off of them and support support their families. It seems like this mishmash kind of like culture is fluid, like you said, has very much influenced your work. Can you tell me about like how how crossing the border, if if that's accurate? Absolutely. Uh, you know, as a kid, as a nine year old crossing that border, you know, two hours every day to go to school, I, I, you're a sponge and I would absorb everything that the vendors had. So seeing Tupac next to SpongeBob, next to, hmm. you know, Bob Marley, next to Scarface, next to Chavo del Ocho, a lot of times I didn't know who, who the people were. And I, I would sort of decipher like, why is Mickey Mouse next to the Virgin Mary? Like all those images got tattooed on my on my eyes. And then the border's alive, right? So I remember when, you know, when Kurt Cobain passed away, uh, the, immediately all this Kurt Cobain stuff started popping up. It's almost like the border honored him with the bootleg, the bootleg mm -hmm. were uh, laying down for him. And, and, and I remember, you know, same thing with Selena uh, was murdered. All the Selena stuff started coming out. Uh, you would know who, what teens were doing well because all their stuff was selling. It was like the border was alive and who they chose to, to honor. And who, by the way, who they chose to vilify, right? So in Halloween, if you saw uh, Salinas de Guartari costumes, basically the border was saying, yeah, the president of Mexico is the devil, right? Like all, hmm. the, all these immediate reactions that as a kid, really informed me, really informed the way I see characters and the way I see color. 
I mixing things is in our DNA. I think as border as border kids having grown up with one foot on each side, you kind of get used to that back and forth every day mm. and being able to to go look at what happens to American culture when it comes down here, but then look at what happens to American cu culture when it's recontextualized and and represented to an American audience. And you know, Bart Sanchez from The Simpsons and all these mm. start happening. I love all that stuff. Because to me, culture is evolution. And so mm. grabbing these things and making them your own, your own that's that's Tijuana, right? That's that's San Diego. That's that hybrid uh, state we get to live in. Mm. Yeah, it's such a fascinating thing. No matter how many hours I've spent talking about the border, I never get tired of it because it, it has this like paradoxical nature where the fact that there is a border makes the artists of this region kind of borderless. Like your, our imaginations right. become very boundless which is such a wild thing that this border creates yeah it's like the the division allows us to grab from both mm. this is which is very rare and you know i always say tijuana is the last corner of latin america the whole continent all the it ends there it's and like the, a funnel it's like a, it's, everything's funneling through really right and the u.s probably one of the most influential cultures in the world again, is right there, right? Los Angeles is, is two hours away where a lot of the music industry, film industry. So the fact that these two forces are constantly at each other, I think that's the, where the magic happens. Mm. Yeah, I completely agree. It's a fascinating place. Uh, before we continue, I want to go back a little bit to, to, so you, as I understand it, your dad was born in Tijuana, but he moved to Mexico City to study architecture and you were born there, but then he for some reason was called back to Tijuana. Do you remember what that move was like and why why your dad decided to go back to Tijuana? Yeah, you know, it was uh, it was early 80s, uh, 84, and my dad, having grown up in Tijuana, went, you know, there was no universities in Tijuana at that time, so he studied architecture in Mexico City, started doing pretty well, met my mom, they got married, and then he said, Mexico City's crazy. There's two, it's just too crazy. Uh, I, I wanna go home, I wanna, I wanna, could basically convince my mother to return to Tijuana. I was nine years old. My my sister was ten. It was a huge move. I mean, for for a kid at that age, especially Mexico City was was our home. So coming to Tijuana was really powerful. Uh, my dad wasn't doing well economically at that time, so we we went from living in a house to living in an apartment. It was a huge change. We had gone to a a school in Mexico City that was supposed to be bilingual. Uh, but my parents didn't speak English, so they didn't know any better that we weren't learning English. And we didn't know, right? We're little kids. <laughs> uh, as soon as we come to, uh, to to Tijuana, and this is, you know, mid-80s, they just didn't like people from Mexico City. Tijuana mm. was a little, uh, little close-minded uh, back then. So we couldn't get accepted into any schools in Tijuana. So then what a lot of middle-class uh, parents do is they, they get uh, student visas for their kids so they can go to study in San Diego. Uh, and so we were sent to uh, Catholic schools. And again, you know, uh, the nuns would say, Jorjito, uh, what is your name? And I would be like, oh, Jorge. And I'd go, where were you born? Jorge. <laughs> What's your favorite food? Jorge. <laughs> and sure enough, these kids don't know any English. <laughs> so they, they put us in a school in San Isidro in the middle, basically for kids who who didn't know English very well and, and knew Spanish. And that's kind of where we learn English. But I learned English watching watching cartoons because I became obsessed with, with that stuff. And, you know, if you told that kid, because I got held back two years, that's how that's how bad I was. Uh, if you told that kid that one day someone will pay you to write, like, it's insane to me that that, that eventually happened. Mm. But the experience was, was pretty shocking. And then I always say, I didn't know I was Mexican until I crossed into the US. That was the first time someone explained it to me, like, oh, you're not from here, you're from over there, you're not an American, you're a Mexican. Like, I, again, at nine years old, you're starting to, to realize, oh, this is, this is different. And then for a kid uh, like me, basically you got to experience two countries every day and you got to see your country, go to another country to go to school and then come back. And so, there, there are moments in the day where I felt like, well, I'm really lucky and I, 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 my parents are doing really well. Oh, no, my parents aren't doing very well <laughs> compared to this. Oh, wait. Mm. So I got to be rich, poor and middle class every day uh, three times. 
mm. based on where I was. And that also, I think, affects you. Uh, and you value things differently and you value you value your country differently. And I think you start, especially for, for as a teenager, you start to go, all right, well, this side is cleaner, but I can have more fun on this side. Hmm. This side is better for this, but this side is better for that. And you start creating your version of the border and you start creating your version of what's better for you because now you have options. And I think for a lot of kids in other places, they don't get to do that. They don't get mm. to go, oh, the weekend, I'm going to go here and then I'm going to go here and, and basically get the best of both worlds. And I think that that also makes it very special. Yeah, I agree. I think if you do have that that privilege to be able to cross, um, the fact that you do have options, like you said, it's like almost neural pathways. Like if you if you get caught in one way of viewing things your whole life, you don't know what's outside of that. I think the the reason this such an imaginative ba- like all the artists from this region that I know are so imaginative and and borderless in their minds is because you do get to see so many ways of so many angles at, of the same thing. Um, do you remember what shows you were watching to learn English? Uh, well, you Growing know, all the traditional G.I. Joe, Transformers, but honestly, yeah. I everything, Gem and the Holograms, I would just try to learn. Uh, and I was that kid who could barely speak and kids made fun of, but it just fueled me to learn even more. <laughs> and then I remember, you know, another another thing that was a big thing was uh, there was a, a, a club, and you know, this is more teenage years, but there was a club called Iguanas, and mm-hmm. that's where a lot of bands would go from from the States. So as a 15-year-old kid in Tijuana, you could go see the Chili Peppers and you could go see, uh, you know, Fishbone. Like, you could go see all these bands uh, that would come to your little city in Mexico. And again, that was super unique. Mm. So all those influences, you know, you turn on the radio and you're listening to stations in San Diego and you're listening to music from both sides. So all that is, I always say it's like, it's like heart proteins coming in from both sides. Wow. Yeah, I guess a lot, a lot of nourishment. Um, I ju- yeah, I just coincidentally by coincidence met Harlan, who is the guy who was bringing all those bands to Iguanas, which was oh, really? incredible. Yeah. Please thank like an, for a change. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I told him like that how many people I've talked to. I'm, I'm too young to have gone to Iguanas, but but every musician that I, every artist that's, that I admire from the border region was somehow touched by iguanas and 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 like their life was enriched by it. So so I thanked him for for everybody. <laughs> yeah, he. I mean, honestly, that there's a whole generation, uh, especially in the '90s, where we got to we got to live and experience both worlds exploding in a positive way. It was it was a unique era, the '90s. Mm. Yeah. How how young were you when you started? funneling your this all this creativity the heart proteins into art when did you start drawing or thinking of yourself as an animator well you know all we always joke that every kid is an artist and some just stop doing it mm-hmm. right because every kid draws pretty much so we were my wife and i were the kids who didn't stop we just kept drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing and then uh at some point my family especially when i was 13 they started going all right well if you're really serious about this uh, we're going to pay for you to take classes. So in Tijuana, I would go to Casa La Cultura and Secut, and I would just take as many classes as I could. And some were very formal, and I, I wasn't a very formal artist, but I, I got a lot out of them. And I remember my dad, you know, especially Casa La Cultura, the only uh, uh, models that they could get were, of course, exotic dancers from, from La Rebo. So he would look at my drawings and he would go, what, what are you drawing? And I'm like, dad, this is what the, this is what the models look like. <laughs> so it, it, was, it was very unique. Again, wanting to be an artist in Tijuana, it was a, a pretty much a, a giant stretch. And I, and I remember a lot of my friends in Tijuana who said, I can do this as an aside, but there's no way I can study this. There's no way my parents will ever support me being an artist. And I, and I had friends in San Diego who would always tell me, you know, my parents worked so hard to come to the U.S. I can't use up that dream to try to pursue something as unstable as the arts. Mm. And so I think for a lot of Latino uh, youth, especially on, on, on both sides of the border, it just seems really risky. So parents are not really encouraging their kids. And, and I remember at that time thinking, well, if no, someone's going to be doing this stuff. And if you're really passionate, you have to power through. But it was really tough. I mean, I, when I finally got into art school, 
I kind of got in as a fluke. I was 17 years old. Uh, I was painting all this Mexican stuff, luchadores and Day of the Dead and all these things. And I was painting all that stuff because I because I loved it, right? And, I, and it was the stuff that I genuinely felt passionate about. But because I wanted to go in animation because I love cartoons, I started drawing all the things I thought the Americans wanted to see. And so I would draw Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse and, you know, uh, Bart Simpson, literally all the things I saw, well, this is what they want. And when I applied to Cal Arts uh, here in LA, uh, the guy who was reviewing my portfolio, he was Hungarian and I was 17. He looked at my drawings and he said, this is crap. This is terrible. And he just destroyed me drawing by drawing. He said, this is awful. This is awful. And he said, a copy machine could have made this. You have no voice. You're not an artist. You're just, you're just drawing what you saw. And, you know, I was devastated, he closed my portfolio, and then I left my painting portfolio on the table, and he opened that, and his eyes exploded, and he, you know, he called me back, and he, he said, well, you know, you son of a bitch, what is this? Uh, and, uh, and I said, oh, this is, you know, these are my paintings. And he grilled me. He said, why did you paint this? I said, well, because this is the stuff I love. And he started laughing, and he said, you stupid boy this is you, this is your voice. That's not your voice, the other stuff, the other stuff that you should burn. This is who, this is who you are. Make this move and you'll be doing something I've never seen. Welcome to the school. And that was it, that wow. guy changed my life. And from that point, the moment that I had thought my culture was to some extent a weakness because I had never seen it in animation and I'd never seen it in cartoons, with those words, he flipped it, and it became my strength. Hmm. What an angel man! I know, I know, right? <laughs> so, 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 the ambitions that you had before that and after that, would you say like clearly very different? Like what you, how you saw your future as an in the in the arts? Yeah, I mean, at that time, I thought I I think I'm pretty good at drawing. I can work in animation, and then I'll paint on the side for me. Uh, to me, it was. Because I had a lot of friends who'd say, oh, I'm going to go into graphic design or engineering, and then I'll play in my band or I'll, you know, do my art on the side. But it, but it was never the same. It was always separate. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the, you know, a lot of it was their parents basically saying, yeah, yeah, I know you love music, but you got to go to, you know, be a doctor or be a dentist, and then you can do your music on the side. And I think that that's a big part of Mexico where parents are just looking out for their kids and they don't mm -hmm. want, they don't want them to take that chance. Yeah, it's understand. I mean, it's it's understandable. I've I've had that in my in my life where it's like, okay, so you love music, maybe write jingles and then do your music on this. You know, it's yeah. whatever it is. It's and and it makes sense. It's your parents just want you to not starve. What <laughs> when did what were you you were saying how like that's very uh, prevalent in Mexican culture? Um, how were your parents? Were your parents supportive when you decided to go to art school? And at what point did they stop worrying about you? I think, you know, for, for my dad uh, being an architect, you know, it, it is an art, but it's a very conservative and more serious art. Uh, he didn't know what to make of me. Uh, and he said, you have this rebel fire in you. And I think you should pursue this. And if it doesn't work out, then you'll have no regrets, mm. which is super rare for a Mexican dad to say that. Uh, and so he, he really supported me. My grandfather supported me, of course. I can't say my mom supported me because I think all Mexican moms just support you, right? If I told my mom, like, mom, I want to be the Pope, she would be like, great. <laughs> uh, start tan guapo como Pope. Yeah. <laughs> she would, like, start making me like. Uh, so I think, I think that was a big moment. But the fact that the school accepted me, and then I was really lucky. I got scholarships from both sides of the border. The, the school gave me scholarships. And then back then, the FONCA, the, the Mexican Arts Council, sponsored me. So I got to go and I did my, my bachelor's and my master's in, in animation. And the more Mexican stuff I did, the more stuff, the more stuff came to me uh, in a natural, organic way. And I remember at that time, a lot of teachers saying, you keep doing this stuff and you're not going to get work because there's nothing like this out there. And so they were right. As soon as I graduated and I would show my, my work to different studios, you know, I'd go to Disney or Cartoon Network or Nickelodeon. Everybody would very politely go, this is great. Where's your, you know, other stuff? And I was like, what do you mean my other stuff? You know, you're, you're not the Mexican stuff, the other stuff. 
And I, I didn't have any of the other stuff. So I couldn't find work. And I remember a producer at Nickelodeon sat me down and he said, well, I'm not gonna hire you, but I love your stuff. And I'm gonna give you some advice. The only person who's gonna hire you to do this Mexican crazy looking stuff that you're doing is you. Hmm. I was like, what do you mean? You have to be sitting where I'm sitting. So you have to pitch your own movies and your own TV shows. And then it can look like this because it's about this. And that was it. I went home and I was like, I'm starting over. And I just started pitching and pitching and pitching. And, you know, that was 20 years ago. <laughs> That's I love so much hearing stories like yours because it really like it's it shows you that if you really stick to, to your like the truest version of your creativity, eventually it's going to work out. Um, even I mean, if you go through the the challenge, the very challenging years. Yeah, I mean, those early years are, I think, are tough for everybody. Uh, but for for me, it was, you know, if you're a Mexican and you graduate college in the U.S., the U.S. government gives you one year called practical training. In that year, you're allowed to stay in the country, and if you don't find the job that sponsors you, you get deported. So, as wow. you can imagine, my friends uh, would graduate and be like, ah, I don't know if I want to work. At Pixar, because it's San Francisco's too cold for me, like stuff like that. And, and for me, it was holy crap! If I don't get a job, I'm gonna get deported. And all the support I gotten from my family and from my country, and literally my cultures on my back, willing me to do these things. If I fail and I go back to Tijuana, I'm gonna be the you know the most talented taco stand guy because uh, I'm not gonna get to. I basically learned to do something that can't be done here. Hmm. So it was it was monumental for me. And it was definitely, you know, especially at that time, this is, I graduated in the year 2000, man, the, the energy in the world was, you know, the world is changing and all these things are happening. The internet was just sort of starting to, to happen. And, and I, I got really lucky. I got to admit, there was a lot of moments where because of the technology changing, they just hired people who knew new things. And I was graduating at the perfect time. And I got to do, you know, my first job out of school was making my own cartoons. Wow. So that's that ruined me because I thought that was normal. Yeah, you you became spoiled in a sense. It's like, I'm not going to go be a nine to five animator anymore. Right. I, I, I said, you know, this is the greatest country on earth. They pay you to make your own stuff. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, I, I want to touch on what you said, because like this idea of kind of having the culture on your back and all the support from your parents, all the sacrifices that your grandparents have made to you to get there. You told my producer Kinsey something that that when you were holding your student visa and being able to cross into the U.S., you felt like you were kind of holding your life in your hands. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about that kind of responsibility and to your family, to your culture and privilege that you felt and how you processed it as an artist? Yeah. Ima imagine being nine years old and being handed a little visa card and with your passport and told, if you lose this, that's it. Hmm. You can't cross. You can't go to school. You can't go to the States. You've literally, you've, you've let us down. You let your grandparents down. You let your country down. <laughs> Take care of this document. At nine years old, that immediately made me grow a mustache. And like, <laughs> like it aged me instantly. I think like I had white hair come out. Uh, but literally crossing the border was such an event every day and, and, and talking to the border, uh, you know, border agents. It was a, a very strong experience at nine years old, especially I, you know, having grown up in Mexico City, I wasn't used to any of this. And so when they would talk to me and I didn't understand them and they could see my terrified face, I think it just it just made them a lot of times they would laugh. But a lot of times they would wonder if there was something wrong with me. And, you know, one, one of the most eventful moments uh, as a nine year old was we were sent uh, ladies would take uh, turns dropping off kids at school. Uh, so it was like a carpool. And I remember we got sent to secondary inspection. We're all holding our little visas, right? Nine, year, nine years old to like 12 or 13 kids. They line us up. They were very, very nice. I, I, I will say they were extra nice because we were kids. And they went by one, one by one and questioned us. And I remember, I will never forget this, the, the, the Border Patrol agent asking me, hey, did you eat or swallow any balloons? And as a kid, oh. I understood the word balloon, but I wasn't sure like eating balloons. I was like, no, no, no entiendo. 
And then the, the kid next to me kind of explained it to me, like, did you eat any balloons? And I was like, no, why would, why would anybody eat a balloon? And the guard was like, can I poke your belly? And so he made me raise my shirt and, you know, I was a chubby kid and he literally started poking my belly and I started giggling and then that was it, right? We got sent. And in the car, I asked, the, you know, the, the 12 year old who to me seemed like, you know, uh, like grandpa of life. Uh, oh no, my, my, my Roomba turned on. Let me turn it off really fast. <laughs> Sorry about that. Time uh, to clean. Oops. Give me one second. Oh man, and that's, and that story is. It's all good. I wish the Roombas played music. Then they just. Right? A little, a little soundtrack. All right. Should it turn off? Yep. We got in the car, and this 13 year old who seemed to me like the most experienced, it was like a, he was like an ex con to me because he, he seemed to know so much. He <laughs> explained like there's people who put drugs in. Uh, balloons and then they tie them and then you eat them and then you cross the border and then you poop them out. I was nine when they were explaining this to me and I was like, what happens if the, you know, what happens if the balloon breaks? And I remember him going, well, then you die. So don't need any of those. And I was like, who's giving? Wow. <laughs> so, Dang, that 12 year old knew a lot. I didn't know that stuff as a 12 year old. Yeah, I mean, right? Like, and then he took out a cigarette. <laughs> Yeah, wow, that sounds like a lot to handle as a as a nine year old. Do you think all these kind of heavier, stressful experiences with, with with border patrol and like even facing the idea of death as a nine year old, right? Like, oh, you eat the drug. Like all these experiences, do you with with border patrol specifically? Do you think um, they shaped your politics or how you think about the world and your place in it as an adult? Absolutely. I mean, you have to you have to remember, especially back then as a kid you're already terrified. So to hear these stories, they, they leave a huge impact. And you know, a lot of the border patrol people, they're doing their jobs and you're terrified of them as a kid. And then when you see someone forget their passport or lose their passport, those are the most horrific traumatic experiences I've ever experienced. Uh, you know, wa watching kids just break down, crying and peeing their pants, being so, so destroyed, having to turn back uh, so those those are big, big things that I think live leave a big imprint on you. And then, as again, as a as a kid growing up on that side, you know, instant mistrust of the police because of all the the stuff that you hear from your parents and all the mm. things that you're witnessing on the Mexican side. And then on the U.S. side, you're also terrified because you know so there's something wrong. You're going to get deported, or they're going to kick you back, or you know. Who knows what's going to happen? So I was terrified equally of the police on both sides. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Um, I want to talk about music because I'm a musician. <clears throat> I know we, we, we briefly went into it, but um, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, y'all. I got bronchitis today. Se sexy bronchitis. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's bronchitis, but it's sexy. It's cool. <laughs> um, how how being at the border kind of amplifies your musical taste. You know, there's like always these pictures of Elvis. I heard, and I know that you got into Elvis for a while. But as a kid, also growing up in Southern Southern California, you said you got really into hip hop and punk music, and and you you met your wife Sandra at a punk show in Tijuana. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about how how about your growing up at the border shaped your musical experience? Absolutely. I think you know. Again, the airwaves don't have visas, and they don't. Sure need to uh, do the line. So we got to hear music from the US, you know, 91X was pretty big in our in our time. And then we were listening to all the bands uh, that would come through Iguanas. Uh, so we, we, you know, again, as teenagers, you start falling in love with these bands and you get these, these tastes. Uh, I remember going to Tower Records, it was like going to Mecca, and then looking at all these CDs and just going like, well, I can afford one CD. So you'd spend hours listening on those stations to see which one you were going to get. So it was, music was, had no passport and had no visa and, and it really carried over. And I remember uh, I discovered hip hop on the border because I bought a bootleg, this is how big of an animation nerd I was. I bought a bootleg uh, Little Mermaid soundtrack because I wanted to hear the Little Mermaid soundtrack and the, the, the CD had an NWA album in there. 
so thankfully I got that one. Wow. I listened to, yeah, I listened to yeah. NW and I was like, this is incredible. <laughs> what is this? Uh, and so I kind of, I kind of discovered hip hop thanks to the little mermaid. Uh, and, and, and who would have thought who do it? Yeah. Right. And then after that, then I started, you know, asking around and, and, and basically I got really into hip hop and I got really into sort of this idea that this music is music and it doesn't matter if I'm, if I'm, <clears throat> I can, you know, if I'm not white, if I connect to the core and I connect to the goodness of certain, because you got to remember that NWA album, the first one, it's really political. Mm. Like it's all about, you know, the police and, and, and equality and like people forget that album is super political. So then I got into public enemy and, and then I got into the Wu-Tang and I got into all these, these nineties hip hop bands. Uh, also, you know, I, I lived through grunge era. So all that stuff was happening, but yeah, music was, was a huge part of it. And then what was happening in Latin America was there's a lot of uh, political, like literally uh, in Mexico, you weren't allowed to have rock shows for many years because the government was scared that there would be a student revolt or, or the youth would take over. So, so rock and roll was outlawed, literally outlawed for years, for, for many, many years. So once the 80s started happening, especially in the 90s, you started seeing bands who would go, hey, I love ska, but then I love uh, merengue and I love, you know, folkloric music but i love david byrne and i love electronica and i love so you started seeing these these hybrids of bands that would embrace the traditional music and mix it with punk and rock and electronica and and it became really exciting because they were singing in our own language which was very rare and they were talking about things that were happening to us because it was always like you know uh listen to the sex pistols and i was like well we don't have a queen but I get it. I totally get it. Like F authority. Uh, so, so here <laughs> about your president and your government and the things that were happening uh, was hugely influential. Mm. Uh, you know, our, the band that me and Sandra, we, we, we met at a, uh, the California fairs, Las Ferias de la California. They would bring bands from Mexico City and from all over. And I remember it was a concert for a band called La Lupita from Mexico City. But the opening band was Tijuana No which was the band that I love, right? Because it was a local band, uh, you know, Ceci Bastida and Julieta Venegas used to be in that band. Uh, and I, we met at that concert and she was, you know, Sandra was two hours late. And I immediately, I fell in love with her and I asked her to marry me two, two weeks from the day we met at that concert. Uh, and she said, no, right? She's very smart. So, but <laughs> getting married, but music has always been a huge part of, I think the border for us. and and a huge memory of you can acknowledge where you're from, but don't let that limit what you do because you can grab things from everywhere else and make those your own. Mm. Uh, so that, I think that was a big lesson that music gave me. So when I started doing my artwork and when I started writing and when I started making movies, that's kind of what I do. I go, I like this Bollywood movie, so I'm gonna grab that idea from there. And I like Japanese animations. So I'm going to grab that from there. And I, you know, I love uh, Diego Rivera murals. And then I love, uh, you know, SQL music for sci-fi. And I start doing what we do in the border where you start, mm. you know, you grab your Elvis and you grab your, your Tupac and you grab your uh, Los Tigres del Norte. And then you, st you basically, that is, that's, that's who we are, right? We are a, a sum of everything we love, but we're also, a product of all those things mixing. Wow, yeah, that's so beautifully put. And that was just music to my ears. It's so funny how many like alignment points I have with you. I, I just spent like two weekends ago following Ceci around Tijuana to like to tell the story of Tijuana No. Tijuana No for that's where I met this guy for Iguanas, because of Tijuana No's story. It's so funny that does Ceci know the story that you met your wife there? I, I, I put that That's incredible that on on an instagram please please tell her i'm a huge fan i'm gonna tell her i'm gonna tell her i'm gonna see her when i go to la soon i'm gonna for oh. sure tell her she's that's so funny and tower records too tower records was like ultimate church to me grow when i was a little kid like nine i also moved here from mexico city i would my parents would give me like whatever it was 10 20 bucks a month to, to because all i wanted to buy was cds and i'm not proud of this as an adult but at the time when i was younger with what 10 duck 10 bucks i could I could afford like one CD a month and I wanted more because there was no Napster or, or, or Spotify. So I would switch the stickers 
on the because they had the used section. So I would switch the stickers so that I could get like two or three CDs. Hey, you, you know, the, for the good of the arts. For the for the, yes, yes, that's what I tell myself now. <laughs> it was like really old school pirating. Um, <laughs> um, anyways, that was a, a nice tangent. Um, when you started going to college in in at, at Cal Arts. Did, do you, did, did you have uh, any sense? Because you, you were not an American citizen at that point, right? No, I mean, I just became an American citizen two years ago. That's how long it took me. Wow. Wow. Did you have any sense of feeling different or like an outsider walking around such a prestigious college campus? You know what? It, what it, the, the good thing about a school like that is that it's very international. There were kids from all over the world. And then I gravitated towards the, the kids from Latin America. And it was the first time I, I had friends from Colombia and Brazil and Argentina. And that's when you started going, oh, we're, we're very similar, but we're completely different. And when they, when they would use, you know, lat, Latino back then uh, to encapsulate a whole continent and the Caribbean islands and put you all together in a group. And then you go, well, we all speak Spanish, but our cultures are completely mm. different. That's like saying earthling. Right. Like just because you're from Earth doesn't mean you have that much. <laughs> so that was that was the first time I, I found myself going, oh, we are seen as a collective, even though we're completely individual in the way we were raised. And then, for example, for me, uh, I started I started really falling in love with Mexican-American culture and falling in love with with this idea that you could be both and that you could feel comfortable with both. And especially in Los Angeles, you know, I, we got to live in Texas for five years. Mexican Americans in Texas, completely different. Uh, it's it, it, depending on I think what state you're in and what literally what city you're in. Uh, the culture just evolves and changes. And for me, it was getting to go to Tijuana every two weeks, right? Because I would go visit Sandra every two weeks. I got to experience college in LA and in Mexico, and it was incredible. It was incredible to to. At, especially when you're at that age, when you are feeding your soul with inspiration to have both of those things, it's a huge luxury. And I, and, you know, I feel super privileged that I got to do that. And my friends mm. thought crazy. They're like, why are you going to Tijuana every two weeks? This is nuts. And then they would go with me once and they would go, oh, that's why you're here. <laughs> you got to come back. Yeah, it's funny. Tijuana has that that electricity for every anyone who I'd say that word to. They're like, immediately excited and as soon as they go they're like it's it's one of my favorite things in life to bring people to tijuana and see see their like the the image they had of it and then the reality like shift before their eyes yeah it's, it's a magical thing and and i think tijuana is tijuana is what you make of it mm. if you want it to be a, a place that inspires you you can but if you want it to be something that is not good to you then you go to those places that are not good to you it, it, it's it's a living city I think that's never, I've never heard something more accurate. It is. It's like a blank canvas for your, how you, like the consciousness you, you project onto it. You can find whatever you want, whether it's from the darkest to yep. the lightest. Yep. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's a mirror. A, <laughs> it is. It's a mirror. That's crazy. I never thought about it that way, but yeah, it's true. Um, anyways, um, when you were at, at, at CalArts, you made a 3D short that got started getting awards and attention. Can you tell me about what the film that was and what you think? people were responding to in that film? So the, the little short is called Carmelo and it was made uh, in a computer. It's all computer animated and it was folk art Mexican wooden dolls. Uh, again, inspired by the, the folk art I would see in the border. Uh, and it was really sad. It was about a kid uh, bullfighter who dies and the whole short is why would a kid die in a bull ring? And so we basically told you the story of, of this kid who wanted to be a bullfighter and it won the student Emmy. It literally changed my life. I got a uh, manager after that. Uh, but the, 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 the thing that I, I look back on is that's the short that started Book of Life. When you look at Book of Life, it's about wooden folk cart dolls and it deals with bullfighting. So uh, that, that's where the inspiration came from. And I remember uh, a teacher in school telling me, you have to die in order to be born again and be an artist. You have to basically kill the non-artist in you to really embrace who you are. And that mm. to me was very Mexican, right? This idea that in order to live, you have to die. Mm. I was already obsessed with, with the concept of, 
of death in, in Latin America and especially in Mexico. And that, that relationship that we have with death that is so unique. Uh, and, 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 you know, one of the things that I always, I love this idea that having death all around you uh, is a great reminder to live. Mm. The only thing that gives life value is death. Mm. So what better way than to have a constant reminder? I, you know, I love the saying that every Mexican has death in, in their ear whispering, live. I love that. I love that too. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it seems like it's a very recurring theme in your work because uh, it's very, at the end, like Christian Catholic, like the, the you must be born again. To, right. to, and But there is like, there's such a, in Mexican culture, it, it's, I think it's a lot more inviting because it's almost like you can be born as something more joyful rather than like being this morose, morbid end thing. It's like, oh, like there's like, there's joy on the other side of this. And, well, and the idea that, as long as we talk about those who are not here, they're with us, right? So mm. like, I talk about my grandfather all the time and I talk about, <clears throat> about them in a joyful way. And what I found, especially early on as a kid, talking to my American friends, they never talked about anybody who passed away. It was such a taboo thing and they, they always sort of got sad thinking about it. And to me, it was always the opposite. It was, well, we should remember all the good stuff. Like what was, what was their favorite food? What was their favorite song? And, you know, I would hear uh, something that reminded me of, you know, I had a friend who passed away when I was a kid and I love, he loved Transformers. So then I love Transformers. And every time I played with Transformers, I would think of him. So it was a positive thing, but I think mm. that is instilled in you as a kid, uh, mm -hmm. this, your, your relationship with death and your, your, the idea that as long as you remember them and as long as you talk about them, uh, your loved ones are with you. Mm. And then if you never talk about them, then, then they really are dead. Right. Yeah, that's uh, that. That is such a such a beautiful relationship to such an inevitable, but just natural part of life. Like you might as well make it. You might as well make it joyful if it's going to be there. Spoiler alert: We're all going to. Yeah, yeah. It's like you might as well bring some color into it. Um. So so let's talk about the book of life a little bit because you said the, apparently the the inspiration for it started many years before the movie actually came to life. Um. And I want to ask you about that, but is it is it really true that when to get to get a made, you showed up at Guillermo del Toro's doorstep with a handful of sketches and a trunk full of tequila to, to pitch him? Absolutely, man, this the, every time I tell the story, I get to relive it, and like again, like hair, white hair comes out, and like. <laughs> <laughs> but he he, you know, he's my hero, Guillermo del Toro. I think I love Iñárritu and I love Cuarón, uh, but Guillermo, especially because of the fantasy, he's he's always been my hero, mm. uh, and I. I had made El Tigre and El Tigre had done pretty well. It won, you know, it won seven Emmys. So at that point, uh, when we started developing the Book of Life, uh, they said, who would be your dream producer? And I was like, well, Guillermo del Toro would be my dream producer. Are you kidding me? So we tried to get him. He turned me down 15 times. Literally, this is meetings that we were set up where I would drive to the meeting and I would see him like getting his car and drive off. It was like a cartoon. And I remember all the producers going like, he just doesn't want to do this. We're wasting time. Uh, but I was like, no, I want to get a no, a no from his face. Yeah. Uh, I, I want, I want that picture. So finally, uh, you know, now we're friends and he, 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 he admits to me that he was fed up and he was like, bring him to my house so I can say no to him, to his face. Yeah. We go to his house. Uh, I show up with, you know, we had my cats, we had all this art. Uh, obviously we had the tequila and, uh, he had given me 30 minutes to pitch him the movie. He gave me a tour of his house, which is in the in the Kronos uh, extended edition uh, bonus features. You can see the crazy, beautiful house he has. It's like a museum. Uh, and he gives me a tour of the house and I'm like peeing my pants. I'm so nervous. Finally, it's time for us to, to go outside and pitch in the movie. And man, it was those moments where I, you know, I said, this is, this is it, ancestors. <laughs> get in me and, and come through and uh and just as i'm you know opening my mouth at this point yeah you know ya me agarro confianza. like he, he we're buddies so he's like Gordo, you have five minutes <laughs> so i was like what i've been practicing the 30 minute pitch all right ancestors give me the strength i take this giant breath and then i kid you not our people our people betrayed me <laughs> and the mansion next door there was three leaf blower guys and it was, it was almost like they were waiting for me to open my mouth. Cause as soon as I opened my mouth, they were like, Orale, wey. 
and so like a wave of sound like so i remember looking at guillermo and like yelling at him yeah <laughs> wait until they're done and he goes gordo four minutes <laughs> So I pitched him the worst version of the movie you can imagine in four minutes. And I almost fall in the pool. And one of our producers just he couldn't take it. He just left. He was like, I've seen enough. The disastrous meeting. I'm, I'm drenched in sweat. We go back to his house. And I just apologize to him. I'm like, yeah, I'm so sorry. I wasted your time. Uh, you know, looking for him to give me some, some hope. Uh, and he just destroyed me. He goes, uh, I said, oh, you know, I'm sorry about the, the crappy pitch. And he goes, ah, that's the. Uh, that's the worst pitch I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so I'm even more devastated. And then he goes, sit down. And he goes, I have two daughters. We would watch El Tigre on Saturday mornings. I know you. I know your sense of humor. I know your art. But most importantly, I know how much you love Mexico. And I love how much, and I love how you see it. So of course I'm going to produce your movie. So then, you know, I stood up and I, I was drenched and I, and I, and he was drenched because it was so hot. And I'd like to believe that our liquids combined at that moment <laughs> and I got some DNA from him. <laughs> and then, uh, and then he said, you know, if you didn't write the script, you're not a real director. And thankfully I had written the script. So I ran to my car, the tequila bottle I had bought broke. And so the script was drenched in tequila. So I run back and I'm like blowing on it. <laughs> And I hand it to him and he you know, grabs it with his beautiful meaty hands and he huh. eyes it and then he smelled it. And he goes, this is a good script. <laughs> <laughs> you signed that as a producer. What an incredible story. Yeah, and you know, wow. like, my life. Guillermo changed my life. That's comedy, dude. That story, like everything happened like a Charlie Chaplin movie. It's like, yeah. <laughs> wow. So why did he say no so many times if he, at the end of the day, he was like, I know you, like, I know it's just like kind of, maybe it was like just to test your persistence or something. I mean, I've asked him and he said, well, you know, I wasn't sure it was you and I get pitched a lot of crappy day of the dead movies. And so I, I just, I wasn't in the mood. Like, hmm. I mean, obviously he's Guillermo, so he gets pitched yeah, yeah. projects from all over the world at all times. But, but now, you know, now when, when your hero becomes your friend, it's always awkward, right? Like he'll call me and like, I'll throw my kid away. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you want. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Um, for, for people who don't know, can you give like a quick pitch of what the Book of Life is and what it's about? A uh, Book of Life is a, is a 90 minute animated feature. Uh, <laughs> pretty much a love letter to my version of, of what the other dead is and what it means. And it's about a kid who is from a, family of bullfighters and he is naturally gifted to be a bullfighter but what he really wants to do is be a musician and play the guitar and so he literally has to die to make that come true and win the love of his life and basically absolve his whole family of bullfighters uh, by apologizing to every bull they've ever killed with a song so it all comes together and then he gets to come back to Earth, right? It's Orpheus, uh, and and fight the bandits that are attacking his town. And then he he saves his his whole uh, his whole town. And it was a huge metaphor for every artist kid that I've ever met who their town didn't believe in them or their family didn't believe in them, and what they had to do and what they had to go through in order to to become that artist. Mm. Yeah, and it's so beautiful. He told the animation is is wow. I was really just like a little kid, and in, in the, when I, I remember seeing animated kids as a movie, like I hadn't I hadn't felt that in a while. Where you're like, this is so uniquely done. Like any, I mean, any animation can be realistic now with with technology, but but the quality of the animation, I was I was blown away. It was amazing. And, and you know, I I love Pinocchio, and I loved folk art in Mexico. So I was like, I want to do my Pinocchio. I want to tell a story. Mm. Mexican folk art dolls coming to life. What was your favorite cameo? Because there's some really good ones. There's like Ice Cube and yeah, I got Ice Cube yeah. and uh, you know again how, as a hip hop fan. That uh, must have been unbelievable, given your love for NWA. Yeah, I, and and by the way, when I pitched him the movie, he was like, he literally took his sunglasses and he was like, you know, I'm not Mexican. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and then I told him, no, but you you basically get to play God. And he put his sunglasses back on and he smiled and he was like, I'll do it. <laughs> it 
those iconic moments. But yeah, I mean, the, that cameo, I mean, I got to work with Danny Trejo and I got to, you know, I'm a big fan of, of pretty much Cheech. Uh, you know, Cheech, Cheech has a, a big influence on my comedy. So getting mm-hmm. to put Gabriel Iglesias, uh, you know, Diego, I basically wrote it for Diego Luna. I love uh, Tu Mama También. That's one of my favorite mm-hmm. movies. So getting to work with, you know, Kedar Castillo, I'm a big soap opera guy too. So it was pretty much everybody I asked said yes, <laughs> which wow. uh, doesn't happen very often. That's that's really amazing. Um, so we're going to take some audience questions now, even though there's so many more questions I want to ask you. Um, let's give the audience a chance to pick your brain a little bit. Uh, as an artist and influential, you know, Mexican, yeah, Mexican artist and influencer, are you feeling hopeful? I think it's never been better in a weird way. Uh, having just, uh, you know, lived through the Trump era, uh, I think, how can I not be full of hope? How can I not be excited for, for what's to come? And then COVID is, you know, knock on wood, but COVID is passing so I've, if you asked me that question two years ago, I would have been like, I don't know what's going to happen. Or even a year ago, I was just a shell shock to everybody. But man, I feel, I feel the winds of change and I feel so much optimism. And honestly, I feel like kids who have lived through this, they're going to be so much more resilient. They just, they just survived this global pandemic that affected every single one of us in the planet like when's the last mm-hmm. time that happened so I, I i'm feeling really hopeful and then creatively i'm freaking exploding with inspiration because i never valued my life more than i have mm. survived this it's like you said having more right here live yeah I've, i completely agree um have you ever considered producing or writing something set in tijuana i uh, i have three things that I'm working on at Netflix that takes place in Tijuana. Oh, so I, yes. Yeah, I get to, to tell uh, Tijuana stories. Because I got to tell you, the moment you say Tijuana to a lot of executives in Hollywood, their eyes go, mm. they go back. And especially if you want to do something with kids, that is not a word they're used to hearing. <laughs> so it, it's taken me a while, but I think I can finally honor uh, our magical city. Oh, I love that. I can't wait to see that. And there was a line in the Book of Life that stuck with me. It was like, be careful where you're jumping. You just might end up in Tijuana. Yeah. And, and I, love that. I love that line, how you snuck that in there. <laughs> <laughs> so I, of course, anything I make now, I, I got to get a, a little Tijuana shout out. Absolutely. Um, what was it like to be separated from a lot of your family through the pandemic in Tijuana? I couldn't cross. You know, it was interesting because uh, we became citizens last year, uh, right before the pandemic. And so we were able to go, we were able to go visit, but because of uh, the, you know, not, not having the vaccines yet and all that stuff, uh, I just talked to my parents online. And honestly, I talked to them more than before the pandemic. And I got to talk to my family in Mexico City more. And I have a sister who lives in Italy. And so in a weird way, the pandemic allowed us to talk more Mm. and having those deeper conversations, especially with my parents about, because they both got COVID. Uh, They were both uh, sick and they're, they're fine. Nothing happened. But when those phone calls happen and when those moments happen, having those conversations where, you know, my dad was basically going, all right, if I die, blah, 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 blah. And then he'd make a joke. Again, more chest hair grew, more white hair came out. It was like instant, uh, instant gravitas. And for mm-hmm. them, imagine being in Tijuana and saying, I, we can't go visit you and we're sick. So mm-hmm. it, it really brought us together. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm, thankful. I'm thankful that all these positive things came from that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like the, I like that idea of instant gravitas. It seems like there's there's way too much of that these days. Um, so I'm going to pair two questions into one. The, there's a, a few artists in the comments. Obviously, want to get some advice from you. What, what what advice would you give to a transfronterizo, transfronteriza artist right now? And that's a more general. And then after that, some specific steps and animations like a, a, a an aspiring animation scriptwriter could take. All right, so the, the advice I give everybody right now is 
there's no more uh the level of, of of play has been evened out you because of covid can live anywhere and you can be in tijuana and apply to a job in la or new york or anywhere in the world now that's the good news the bad news is you are now competing with everybody in the world so you have to be realistic and you have to be really really conscious of who are the people getting their jobs look at their work and if your work is not up to those professional standards then you need to get to work and when i say get to work i mean figure drawing and construction and line of action and anatomy these are all technical things that anybody can do if they just practice that's what's great about animation the more you do it the better you get at it and so if you are hungry and you are willing to put in the hours they come back to you tenfold so i always tell everybody don't be intimidated know that every single director every single showrunner every single one of them they didn't they weren't born and came out of their mothers and they were given a movie they worked their way up and every single one of them more than likely went to school and more than likely is exactly where you are they started mm -hmm. from the bottom and they worked their way up <clears throat> it's just just study the ladder study what everybody went through uh the advice for for people who want to be screenwriters in animation all the information's online. Read all the, all the books about screenwriting. Screenwriting is a craft. Uh, and if you're artistic, then you can apply the craft and make something amazing. And a good script wins every time. And it doesn't matter who wrote it. If the script is good, they will find you. But those scripts better be amazing because there's a lot of competition. Mm. So all this stuff is there for the taking. And I always say, if I could do it, Right? Anybody can do it. If a kid from Mexico City who went to Tijuana, who's, you know, on the autism spectrum can do all this, everybody can do it. They just mm -hmm. have to work crazy hard. Words, words of wisdom. Um, we have a few, just two or three more questions. Do you think you can stick on for a few more minutes to finish them off? Yeah? Cool. Uh, and we're um, what's up? We're family now. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Uh, so the next question someone asked, you went to school in Coronado, right? Were you surprised by the recent tortilla incident in which Coronado students threw tortillas at a basketball game at a team made up of mostly Latinos? Hell no, I wasn't surprised because Coronado, <clears throat> when I went to school there, was pretty conservative, uh, right? It's a Navy town. And uh, I am mm. not surprised, not surprised at all. Uh, there was a, always a weird animosity and a weird, uh, you know, San Diego has has some areas where do, they do not like the Mexicans. So mm -hmm. I was not surprised at all. And I have a lot of friends who live there. So <clears throat> I was- Yeah, like, Coronado is not, the, not <laughs> necessarily the most liberal place <laughs> in California. Yeah. Um, okay. What's the next one? What keeps you motivated when you're feeling frustrated at, in your creative endeavors? All right. So this is super dangerous when I give this advice, but it works for me. So I found that a lot of artists put a carrot of success in front of them to motivate them, right? If I do this, I'll get this. And if I get that, I'll get this. I'm the opposite way. And maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it's because I'm, I'm neurodiverse, but the way I look at it is if I fail, that's my motivation. If I fail, I let down my wife, I let down my son, I let down my parents, I let down my culture. Look at all the effort they put into me. Look at how hard I've worked. If I hmm. fail, that's what fuels me. Look at the opportunity I, I, I wasted. Look at all the belief that was in me that I destroyed. Look at look at how much faith was put in me and I'm letting people down. And that fuels me. Like it's, it's the fear of failure will always be there for every artist. So I like to poke the monster of fear in the eye and yell at it. So it chases me even more. Mm -hmm. And I'm stressed because it, you know, <laughs> very stressful, but I kind of thrive on that stuff. And that's why the pandemic really, really helped me. Like it really motivated me even more. Because mm -hmm. now, like, well, now you might die. So make it count. Yeah, I feel you. It was like a focusing mechanism. Yep. Um, yeah. Get kind of like shed, shed the non-essential things, you petty things you worry about and just like, okay, okay, you could die today. You might as well just go for it. Go for it. And, and legacy. What, what are you leaving behind if, if it ends? <clears throat> 
So someone just asked how they, they say they love how you build on the importance of storytelling and, and cultural, uh, cultural power, but that often we see cultural elements like food and music and colors easily received and say appropriated, but the people, the actual people of that represent those cultures are not. Uh, so they want to know what can we do as storytellers to push for social change? And can you speak more about this hope, this hope you feel? Well, you know, cultural appropriation, obviously not cool and, and very complicated, uh, but the history of entertainment, the history of movies, where a lot of times, you know, is usually uh, uh, white men were telling all the stories. Uh, and, and so if you, it gets a little complex. And then if you go, all right, so only people of specifically that culture or gender can tell those stories then, for example, I'm only allowed to tell stories about a kid from Mexico City who grew up in Tijuana, right? That's basically it. And I wouldn't be allowed to tell the story of a Mesoamerican fantasy warrior princess because I'm not a Mesoamerican warrior princess. <laughs> so that's where it gets a little complicated. Uh, and so you have to do your research and you have to be very sensitive and you have to do lots and lots and lots of the hard work mm. of figuring out how do I how do I represent this in a, an honorable way, you know, right? I'm, you know, I'm from Mexico, so I'm, I'm basically mestizo. This is my birthright, uh, having been born in Mexico and in Mexico City. Uh, so I, I view all these things in a way where uh, they belong to me because they're part of where I'm from. Uh, I get really nervous when I see stuff about Mexico created by people who are not part of the culture or, or never been to Mexico or, or they're looking at it from the outside. And while I, a lot of times they're very respectful, uh, they, they taste to me like someone looking from the outside in. So I, I connect more with things that are uh, authentic that way. And at the same time, I go, all right, I love Seven Samurai. Seven Samurai is my favorite movie, right? Kurosawa. I've never been to Japan, but the story of uh warriors who die for farmers defending them from bandits that could take place in tijuana that could take place in china that could take place in brazil that could place take place today 500 years ago so to me those stories right amelie is one of my favorite movies uh, city of god in brazil is one of my favorite mm. movies these stories are universal because their themes are universal but they're culturally specific to the filmmaker and the storyteller of those countries. Mm -hmm. So that's how I try to approach my stuff. I go, all my stuff is going to be really rooted in Mexico, but it's not just for Mexicans. It's for everybody because emotion is universal. And so as long as you have empathy for these characters and you have empathy for these stories, the dressing and the canvas can be incredibly authentic, but the heart has to be universal. Yeah, that's very well said. <clears throat> okay, we have one more question. One more question. This has been incredible fun. Thank you, Jorge, so much for uh, you're awesome. Such... Dude, I, I hope we get to meet in person one day. <clears throat> uh, if I get bronchitis, I, I sound as good as you. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you some vocal exercises. <laughs> um, last question, very important question. Someone asked, "What kind of tequila did you bring to Guillermo?" Uh, so it was. <laughs> Uh, Herradura Reposado, which is the, the, the tequila that uh, we had at our, at our wedding, and it's, it's my favorite tequila. Uh, the bottle broke, so he got nothing. <laughs> he oh, wow. He scripted from it. Uh, but yeah, you know, it, it's one, the way I feel about tequila is like, I smell that tequila and it brings me back to my wedding and it brings me back to mm. my grandfather laughing and our family being there and my wife looking, you know, fucking like spectacular that night. Uh, and, and so those smells immediately, like ratatouille, they take me back to those moments. Mm. Uh, I try to share that tequila. And of course, it doesn't mean any of that to anybody else, but it means it to me when I give it away. Mm. I think people feel that even if they don't know it in their minds, they can feel the, oh, the yeah. love you bring to it. Yeah, I mean, you know, tequila, we, we, we drink tequila to celebrate and to, and when things are going good, it's all, it's a friend, hmm. it's a friend who's always there. It's a mirror, like you said. It's a mirror. <laughs> cool. Well, that is every, every, that's all the questions. Thank you, everybody. I can't see who's here, but I thank you so much for being here and listening to us. I hope you go watch Jorge's movies, his work, follow, watch Maya when it comes out and 
I cannot wait for these Tijuana animated projects. That's going to be, that's super exciting. Um, thank you, Jorge. Thank